please start your speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samir. Uh, I, I would appreciate it if, uh, if, if uh, you can mute your, uh, uh, your microphones. Uh, again, thank you for the very lengthy introduction, and I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure being here, and, and thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, I was hoping, of course, that we would have done this earlier in the spring. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we could not do it in person. And 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 personally, I I very much look forward uh, to being with all of you um, next year uh, when we redo this conference, hopefully on the ground uh, one more time. Uh, again, thank you all for the gracious gracious invitation and and for attending this. Uh, as 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 Dr. Samir uh, mentioned, uh, I currently work at Lawrence Technological University. And I want to speak uh, for a minute or two before the presentation about the about that particular university, uh, because really what I'm going to talk about is more or less uh, within the vision and, and the context of, of my current uh, place of work. Uh, the, the United States uh, is, is, uh, is, is, a, is a country that is home to, believe it or not, uh, 6,000 institutions of higher education. Uh, ranging from two-year community colleges all the way to research one uh, universities. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, amongst these 6,000 institutions of higher education, there are only 56 quote-unquote technological universities, uh, meaning universities that emphasize science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, uh, in all its disciplines uh, that they offer. Uh, out of these 50, meet less than 1% of the universities in the US. Amongst these 56 universities, uh, half, 28, are actually universities that offer only a bachelor's degree as a terminal credentials, meaning they are colleges. And 28 are doctoral universities. Uh, so, so that number, again, of doctoral universities is actually less than a half percent. Uh, of all the institutions of higher learning at the U.S. And amongst these 28, there are only 13 uh, private schools. Excuse me, Professor Sob. So are you sharing your slides with us? I will at some point. Don't worry about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, as I was mentioning, uh, uh, these 13 private doctoral technological universities uh, say, share some characteristics that I tried to talk about at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, one of them is that they are all comprehensive. They are not glorified engineering schools. But the interesting characteristic within these universities is that they are, number one, very interdisciplinary. And number two, they ensure that regardless of the major or the discipline that our students at all levels, uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD graduate, we ensure that they are very technologically savvy at the end of their studies at the university. So when we talk about, for example, healthcare or health sciences, uh, we ensure that the graduates from these clinical-based programs are very well trained in areas like robotic surgery, in areas like virtual medicine and telemedicine, in areas like clinical simulation uh, training, et cetera. Uh, when we graduate people from schools of architecture, we ensure that they are very, very well trained on 3D printing of houses very well trained on virtual simulation and walkthroughs in design and architecture. When we graduate students from our schools of business, we ensure that they are very well STEM trained in advanced statistics, business intelligence and data analytics and data sciences and such. And I, and I, and I think that's the theme of what I would like to talk about for the next 30 or 40 minutes, which is really how to ensure that our graduates both from an education point of view and from a research point of view, are actually very well trained and ready for the jobs of the future, which will be, in whatever discipline, very dependent on significant technological training and very much dependent on STEM. And, and, and that's really the theme uh, of the presentation. Uh, again, you know, from the point of view of uh, 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 of the presentation, uh, uh, which uh, I hope that you can see now. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about, again, is developing a culture of creativity and innovation. 
uh, in particular recent directions in multidisciplinary education and research, uh, with some few examples from robotics as a case study of one of these disciplines that exhibit interdisciplinary education and research in which graduates and both professionals and educators uh, can contribute regardless of their disciplinary background. Uh, again, uh, I do come from uh, Lawrence Tech uh, in Michigan. Uh, prior to that, I used to be at the University of Bridgeport for uh, nearly a quarter of a century. And, and of course, again, Lawrence Tech is one of these universities that exhibit this particular culture of creativity and innovation in all the disciplines, emphasizing technology and STEM in all this offering at all the times. Um, uh, from an outline point of view, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start talking about central directions in education and research in general, new directions, education scholarship as a paradigm, and how to take the right graduate professional and researchers, new disciplines and challenges, and I'll try to talk a little bit uh, about robotics again as a case example of such emerging multidisciplinary uh, disciplines uh, uh, going forward. Uh, again, these are central issues in education and research and some thoughts from the late 80s. Uh, again, within the late 80s, early 90s, there was great emphasis on manufacturing and design, concurrency and product realization. And, and, and of course, during the emergence of the interest in education and research within these areas in the late 80s and 90s, it became kind of apparent and evident that linking uh, uh, design uh, and, and, and schools of design and programs in manufacturing and mechanical engineering, uh, in addition, of course, to the requisite uh, business structures and business planning, et cetera, to realize and commercialize products and designs, required, again, the interdisciplinary collaborations of uh, such disparate entities that used to work in silos, uh, like schools of engineering and schools of business and mechanical engineering and schools of design and such. Uh, fast forward again to the early uh, 90s, uh, the, the, the growing role of computer and software tools became incredibly evident, uh, especially with the emergence of the manufacturing paradigms in the 1980s. It became very obvious that uh, one could do things like prototyping without necessarily having to build humongous structures. Uh, uh, in, in the old days, uh, engineers, designers had to build structures and test them and then revamp their design and rebuild and remanufacture and retest. And again, the cycle used to be very significant. Uh, with the emergence of compute power and software tools, it became relatively simply with, relatively simple with the right modeling tools, with the right visualization, simulation and design tools that we could build uh, incredibly complex structures, including things like airplanes, uh, completely virtually be able to simulate them, be able to simulate the controls, the aerodynamics, the materials, uh, and, 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 and many other aspects of the design and do extensive testing and close the feedback on testing over and over in order to do incremental uh, uh, improvements without actually having to build these prototypes at every step of the way. So again, the growing role of computer and software tools in general and particularly simulation, visualization, and design tools, and the emergence of such powerful uh, uh, capabilities, uh, which is, of course, due to the uh, uh, amazing uh, 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 compute power being available, uh, both on the desktop and, and, and things like supercomputers enabled us to, of course, fast forward 20, 30 years, uh, we don't even need to have that compute power anyway, anyway, uh, locally uh, within the work environment or the company or the university, because most of these extensive computations are really done on the cloud. Uh, so, uh, and, and basically computing became just a service uh, and, and uh, things like memory requirements, things like incredible uh, and, and, and very speedy computations became very tenable and very uh, accessible to, to the average designer, to the average startup, to the average company and so on and so forth. But more importantly, from the point of research, from the point of education, in such areas, again, like robotics and automation and control and such, and computer vision and object recognition, uh, all of these tools became um, available to, uh, to students. 
and, and I don't mean uh, only graduate uh, students and researchers and PhD students, uh, but they became available to, to freshmen in college, 18 year olds. Uh, incredible power uh, enabling really dissemination of these. Uh, uh, of these. Uh, the growing importance of information technology, the growing importance of multidisciplinary education, uh, 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 obviously be became more evident. Uh, as, as engineers and scientists, and I'll use myself as an example, uh, 30 years ago when I was uh, studying at the uh, at Alexandria University in, in Egypt, actually more than 30 years ago, uh, I, I never imagined as a, as a young budding computer and electrical engineer uh, that I would have to work within the area of biology uh, or that I would have to uh, work within the area of material sciences. Uh, and of course, all of these uh, uh, disciplines and all of these thresholds between the disciplines, uh, particularly in my chosen area of, of research and scholarship, uh, have started to disappear very, very rapidly. Uh, who would have thought uh, 20 years ago or, or even 10 years ago that there would be or there would have been a job title called autonomous car engineer? Uh, who would have thought 20 years ago that there would have been a job title called nanotechnologist? Or, or for that matter, a social media marketer. We didn't even have social media. Uh, who would have thought again that we would have uh, fields uh, that integrate computing and business and so on, like digital media marketing, uh, which really is an intersection of advanced statistics, analytics, computer science, uh, coding, and decision making. And, and the list continues. Uh, so again, someone like me, having chosen the area of robotics and automation, uh, uh, you know, and, and my colleagues and, and my students all over the years had to have that breadth of education and breadth of knowledge in many auxiliary areas of study in order to be functional within the area of, for example, robotics and automation. Uh, working on things like biomechanics and robotic prosthesis, uh, et cetera, uh, required uh, for any uh, serious uh, roboticist uh, reasonable knowledge, at least, if not incredibly in-depth knowledge of biology, working on the area of cognition, working on the area of autonomous robotics, uh, whether they are unmanned vehicles, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, 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 on the water or autonomous submarines or, uh, 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 or uh, uh, mobile autonomous platforms on the ground, uh, required knowledge in, in areas that are relevant to uh, pattern recognition. And, and, and cognitive sciences, working within the area of uh, humanoid robots and within the area of trying to capture uh, uh, emotional expressions of, of people in order to be able to react appropriately uh, from a security point of view in an area like biometrics required uh, significant knowledge, again, within the area of neurosciences and cognitive sciences, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's, it's truly a, a changing landscape for education and research. The idea that scientists and researchers and students are able or could be able to function and be impactful in their chosen area of research development and or within the area of, of interest uh, requires not only uh, a depth of knowledge in one particular area, don't get me wrong, that's still required, but also to, to truly be having a, a significant impact, a broader impact, and to work on projects that could be transformative for humanity, it became incredibly evident that there is a requirement for people to transcend the boundaries of classical disciplines and to be well-rounded from a breadth point of view in their education and research endeavors. Uh, again, we're, we're, I'm not saying that uh, we should uh, dispense uh, with everything that we need uh, to, to talk about when it comes to discipline. Uh, but we, we need not only to have a depth in one or two areas, but to really be functional in the 21st century economy, the technological-based economy. Uh, our graduates and our researchers and our scientists need to be cross-trained uh, 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 in a breadth of ancillary areas in order to have uh, that particular uh, impact. The, the, the list continues and goes on. Uh, again, uh, in 10, 15 years, as educators and researchers, uh, we simply don't know what job titles our graduates and students are gonna have. 
uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, 10, 20 years ago, there was no job title called virtual reality simulator, and uh, gaming designer, and nanotechnologist, and so on and so forth. And again, you know, 10, 15 years from now, uh, we have no idea uh, what our uh, graduates will actually uh, be working in. Uh, uh, there are changing paradigms and shifts, uh, and, and we don't know what even job titles they acquire. So the only way to really address this in order to provide a workforce that is uh, creative, innovative, uh, uh, able to cope with the times and work in these emerging disciplines is to make sure that they are cross-trained across so many different disciplines and have a breadth of knowledge that enable them to be functional professionals in the 21st century futuristic economy uh, and to really be able to uh, acquire these jobs that don't have a title yet. Uh, uh, moving forward, uh, again, um, central issues in education research in the 21st century uh, imply uh, knowledge in areas like micro and nanoscales, uh, areas like, uh, you know, these uh, micro robots that develop and uh, uh, drugs in a timed fashion inside the body and or nanostructures that can do work at the cell level as opposed to only drug delivery within uh, arteries and veins and organs. Uh, require knowledge in areas relating to physics and chemistry and biology. Uh, design in the micro nano scales when it comes to uh, micro and nano robotics is an area in which a roboticist, as an example, should be functionally, functionally con conversant and, and cognizant of advances in material sciences and biology and, and chemistry in order to be able to have a significant impact. Again, the growing importance of biological sciences uh, increase the pressure to transcend the academic boundaries and, and really led the way uh, for many uh, universities and research programs to be uh, uh, very well uh, ingrained within the concept of multidisciplinary education. Uh, curriculum requirements when it comes to education and accreditation requirements were always rigid and were always based on bean counting. Uh, my colleagues here uh, who are graduates of uh, science programs and, uh, uh, and or educators and researchers and engineering and such uh, used to refer to this as bean counting. Uh, we graduate students when they have finished things like calculus one, calculus two, calculus three, and circuits one and circuits two, and, and uh, mechanics and, uh, and, and uh, uh, kinematics and, and, and so on. Uh, that, that is very vastly disappearing. Uh, 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 innovative educational programs are becoming much less rigid uh, in the sense that they give leverage to the instructors and the researchers to dispense knowledge, uh, not being incredibly bounded by, by counting courses and counting things. Uh, again, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, look at us now. You know, we're doing this uh, uh, wonderful international conference uh, uh, via the internet. And uh, of course, uh, COVID uh, notwithstanding, and, and that will go away at some point, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully, <laughs> uh, uh, will lead uh, to a complete change in the way that we do business. Uh, asynchronous and synchronous distance learning, the concept of a virtual university, the way that 17 and 18 years uh, old students uh, learn and, and, and study and understand and, and, and so on is very, very, very different from my generation at least. Uh, 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 at that age, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and even, you know, I would say from 15 to 25, uh, the idea of things like uh, reading uh, newspapers and listening to national public radio and, and things like that are, are, are disappearing. Uh, it's all uh, videos. It's all uh, two, three minute segments of, of things. It's all uh, uh, about interaction and learning by talking with other people as opposed to sitting in front of a lecturer or a professor uh, who is lecturing and writing things on a, or displaying PowerPoints like we're doing right now. It's all about immersion. It's all about a virtual and or physical uh, laboratory experience. And, and, and I think what, what COVID did for us, which was horrendous, of course, uh, have really emphasized this, have emphasized the need for information technologies and a different way of dissemination collaborating going forward even after uh, COVID is uh, done. Uh, again, issues like socialization of learning, student-centered 
learning activities as opposed to lecturing activities. Uh, relationships with industry and integrating industry and companies within everything we do within the classes from a research and education point of view so that the end goal is clear is becoming really uh, the motto or the uh, uh, standard operating procedures uh, in higher education. Uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, issues that I'll touch upon very briefly is the is, is the, are the grand challenges and I encourage you to actually take a look at these they are very descriptive. Uh, the National Academy of Engineering in the U.S. came up with, uh, approximately six years ago, came up with 14 challenges facing humanity in the 21st century. And these challenges are very interdisciplinary in nature, and they vary from the mundane, things like uh, clean water, uh, all the way to very exotic challenges like reverse engineering the brain, uh, and or other challenges like uh, personalized medicine. Uh, which would be based on the person as opposed to the concept of over-the-counter medicine, but it would be based on the DNA and the genetics of individuals for every kind of ailment, uh, 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 mitigating nuclear threat, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and, and the interesting thing that the Academy came up with, and there are 30, well, now 60-something universities in the U.S., in, including my own, uh, that are part of this uh, 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 Grand Challenges Network, uh, what, what, what they require uh, schools uh, to do uh, is not only make our students, regardless of their majors, whether it's, again, engineering or science or technology or business, or even arts and design, uh, proficient uh, in one of these multidisciplinary challenges facing humanity, but they emphasize that the training and the research and the education dispensed in order to graduate a student who is knowledgeable and capable of addressing and working on one of these 14 challenges facing humanity, they also require them to, to be very broadly and cross-disciplinary trained in, to be able to address these challenges via an entrepreneurship component where they can find micro-solutions to some of these challenges uh, via service, uh, making sure that the students are actually able to work and provide global and or local service uh, to communities within one of these areas. Uh, they require them to be very well cross-disciplinary research trained in order to be able to address uh, one of these challenges uh, and also to be globally engaged by trying to find solutions not only within their own local communities, but also for global communities across the globe. So again, the, the, the idea of interdisciplinary education to address some of these multidisciplinary challenges is not only about the research component, but it is about an immersive experience to try to educate our future researchers and students, not only to address the research problem, but to also co contextualize the research problem and be able to address and solve facets for it via service, via entrepreneurship, via research and intellectual merit, and via global engagement in order to create these global uh, uh, citizens of the future who are eminently well-trained in STEM and able to address future challenges. Uh, uh, again, uh, some new directions, uh, uh, very briefly touching on these, include introduction to systems, uh, multidisciplinary experiential and contextual participation of all faculty and students, and, and projects including design, build, and test activities, both virtually and actually uh, uh, in laboratories. Uh, so, so the bottom line is, uh, again, in areas like robotics and automation, nanotechnologies, blockchain, internet of things, cloud computing, et cetera, et cetera. It's all becoming about the application. It's all becoming about solving an interdisciplinary problem and getting the requisite training that is very breadth-based in an interactive and collaborative manner. And, and we are seeing that shift now, shift from faculty and lecture-centered activities to student-centered projects and uh, team-based activities. Uh, what you see here is, uh, is an example of, of, of the classroom of the future. Uh, actually, it's a classroom of now. Uh, again, uh, uh, again, this is, in, in, in our case, us at Loris Tech. This is uh, a prototype of what the classrooms look like. They are not going to be classrooms in which you have white or black boards 
and a faculty member teaching, they are going to be learning centers, including, as you see on the left, laboratories, prototyping spaces, design making and test equipment, maker spaces for prototyping and 3D printing and embedded systems, et cetera, manufacturing facilities, uh, display rooms. What you see at the bottom is an example of collaborative lecturing and research space where students work in clusters, they have the equipment around, instructors and or colleagues provide help to them. They are able to discuss these projects for cross-pollination of ideas and, and basically other constituencies walking around and, and taking a look at these study spaces, interacting with students and, and research. Uh, multimedia presentations, demonstration areas, work study places, etc. Uh, again, this is a classic design of a learning center. Uh, again, this is the classroom of the future. This is the research area of the future. The threshold between education and research is it has disappeared already. We're expecting our undergraduates to learn, to make, to do research, to do background, to prototype, and to create things starting with their undergraduate years, uh, which again is a very big shift in paradigm. Uh, you, in, a, in an area like this, which is a prototype for a robotics laboratory, uh, you see manipulators, you see unmanned air vehicles and drones flying around, you see mobile platforms being built, you see computer engineers working together with coders from computer science, working together with mathematics students, working on things like kinematics and inverse kinematics, working together with biology students and faculty and postdocs on things like biomechanics and prothesis design, working together with design students on product realization and commercialization, working together with business students who are witnessing and partnering in these activities, providing things like business plan for startups. Uh, and it's all one. It doesn't really matter which college or discipline uh, these faculty and or undergraduate students or graduate students or postdoctoral fellow, fellows or industry advisory board professionals come from. Uh, it's all towards creating, again, an environment that's conducive to producing projects and scholars that are cross-trained. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, th th these are the, uh, the problems and the plan. Uh, K-12 education has always worked in silos. Us as educators, as, as, as higher education, multidisciplinary leaning uh, researchers and educators have to actually work with K-12 now in order to produce students who are excited in STEM and multidisciplinary education. Uh, it behooves me that in the 21st century, uh, students in, things, in high schools uh, and or uh, even middle schools are studying the exact same curriculum in many, many countries, including the US, that they have studies in, that they have studied in the 50s and 60s of the last century. Uh, there is a need to get away from that. There is a need for innovative and creative higher education institutes to engage early with students on high schools in order to expose them to these careers of the future and disciplines of the future that are not necessarily housed again in one department, one school, one college, but really are uh, endeavors that are uh, uh, that span many, many disciplines in order to excite them about science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, new programs are going to be out of place, utilizing outstanding and unique human and technology resources. Uh, and, and that's really the wave uh, of the future. Uh, traditional degrees, uh, again, uh, what does that mean? Not much anymore. Uh, yes, we are gonna graduate computer engineers and computer scientists and mechanical engineers and mathematics and, you know, majors and biology majors and design majors. Uh, but at the end of the day, every one of them is gonna be different. Every one of these graduates, uh, one mechanical engineer might be very well trained in areas like biomechanics means his or his cross-disciplinary training within the program might have been very significantly infused with uh, quantitative physiology, with biology, with biochemistry, etc. Another mechanical engineer or electrical engineer might be specialized in embedded systems for robotics. Uh, that particular lady or gentleman are going to be very well trained in mathematics for robotics application, are going to be very well trained in electronics, embedded system design, digital design, signal processing, uh, and electronics. 
uh, they're going to be probably very well trained in areas like computer vision, image processing, pattern recognition, and, and, uh, and detections, uh, etc. Uh, they all have, you know, the same degree, quote unquote, name. Uh, but again, the range and the span of the education will be probably very multidisciplinary based on what particular specialization or interesting interdisciplinary individual students are working on in their projects, both at the undergraduate level and also at the uh, uh, at the uh, graduate level. Uh, again, uh, 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 internationalization, globalization, attracting international talent both ways uh, between countries in, in Europe, Africa, Middle East, and the U.S. will continue. There is no stopping that. Uh, international talent will, will be attracted. The idea of working from a distance, the idea of, uh, of, of borders uh, is, is disappearing fast. Uh, even looking at the last few years, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, for example, in the U.S., uh, yes, there were the restrictions uh, 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 on things like uh, international migration of students in the U.S. That's probably going to go away anyway. But even during that period, uh, uh, companies became very, very innovative uh, and have hired employees all over uh, in southeastern Asia and China and in India, Middle East, uh, and so on, uh, without having physically relocated them. Uh, in North America. Uh, of course, with COVID, that's more of an emphasis. We're seeing that happening more and more and more. And, and that will continue to happen. And these multidisciplinary global collaborations both in the workplace and for research and development and innovation uh, will continue to happen. Uh, our host, Dr. Samir and myself, uh, for, a, for a long while, we were involved with, uh, with an endeavor uh, within the area of uh, uh, online engineering and uh, online education spanning 15 years ago. Um, and the idea with that endeavor was to actually try to put several laboratories and equipment online. Uh, and I'm talking about full laboratories. Uh, so someone like me was always hoping uh, that I'll be able to attract students who do not necessarily have to come uh, to my robotics lab uh, in Bridgeport or in Lawrence Tech now, but be able to use the equipment, whatever they are, you know, manipulators, articulated structures, unmanned air vehicles, unmanned uh, uh, mobile platforms, etc. In addition to control devices and be able to control and learn and do exercises without having to be physically present. And at the time we started this endeavor again 15 years ago, many of us, including people like myself and, and Dr. Samir and many colleagues, uh, thought that these endeavors are incredibly exotic and uh, cutting edge. Uh, fast forward 10, 15 years later, uh, it's becoming a necessity with COVID, right? Uh, all of these endeavors and online collaborative activities uh, simply became uh, uh, the norm and the way to do business, which again will help in rapidly accelerating uh, prototyping activities within interdisciplinary areas of study and, and professional work, including again, uh, such areas that exhibit a high need for laboratory existence uh, like, for example, automation and robotics. Uh, again, this is one of my favorite quotes uh, from a great colleague, Joe Bordonia, who used to be the chief operating officer of the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Uh, and, and actually, I'd like to expand on that because at that time, on the definition of a future engineer, and, and at that time, it was all about engineering 2020 uh, because people 20, 15 years ago always thought that 2020 is going to be uh, a, 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 a good date for things to have very, very much changed in terms of education and research. <laughs> Little bit did we know uh, about what happened in 2020, uh, very unfortunately. Um, but, but again, the, the point is for these 2020 engineers, uh, I'm going to change the, the, you know, the idea of future engineer and actually change that to future professional. These are the future professional characteristics that we would like to dispense, articulate, and ensure in our undergraduate and graduate students and researchers, being holistic designers, makers, trusted innovators, creators, and harm avoiders, change agents who think out of the box and out of the, uh, uh, the boundaries of their comfort zone when it comes to a discipline that they are studying. Uh, 
in order to create a significant impact. Uh, enterprise enablers, handlers of knowledge who are capable of being uh, doing the appropriate background in order to produce significant intellectual merit in their area. And obviously a technology steward, regardless of the discipline. So the, the bottom line is, this is the new engineer. This is the new professional of the future. Doesn't even matter again, whether they are engineers or business professionals uh, or health sciences professionals, uh, designers uh, or, or, or any other discipline. This is what we really think of when we think about creating engineers. Uh, there is a need for a model of education suitable to a new world in which change and complexity are the rule, ever-changing, globally linked world that needs integration in, in, in many ways. Um, again, uh, biology uh, work on the terrain scale uh, for things like weather forecasting, for things like large-scale simulations, which are being very doable now on the cloud without having to acquire incredibly expensive and elaborate compute power, uh, terabyte networking uh, with things like 5G and what's to come. Uh, we have incredible, humongous uh, uh, compute power in our hand uh, that's being done in the cloud using uh, thousands, if not millions of processors very cheaply. Uh, again, uh, infrastructure applications and communication simulations and visualizations are becoming very doable in addition to real-time capabilities. Uh, working in the nanoscale, working in the femtoscale, working in the microscale. Again, uh, for developing microelectromechanical systems, both for robotic applications, for application and designing fabrics, for applications uh, in having uh, sensors for vehicles, both autonomous and for harm avoidance, uh, 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 smart uh, dust agents, uh, for detection of things like viruses, et cetera, which are very much needed right now, uh, are becoming the norm. Uh, working again in the microelectromechanics and again at the micro and nanoscale, the cell level, uh, requires not only engineering background, but requires material sciences, chemistry, biochemistry, physical chemistry, and biology and physiology backgrounds. Uh, again, for temperature, weather forecasting, motion detection, uh, uh, climate change applications, mitigating climate change, uh, uh, doing vision application for security in areas like object recognition, weapon recognition, uh, event recognition, uh, etc. Uh, uh, again, um, program development, exploring new program developments. Uh, again, uh, you see a sample of one study that was done uh, about what these areas are. Again, including global supply chain management, artificial intelligence with all of its sub-disciplines, whether in the area of cybersecurity, whether in the area of analytics, whether in the area of sensing, whether in the area of robotics, or whether in the area of biomedical sciences uh, is becoming uh, very prevalent and emerging. Business intelligence data analytics, entrepreneurship, nanotechnologies, sustainable environmental programming, both in architectural design, both in environmental sciences uh, are emerging forensics. And when I say forensics, I mean all aspects, chemical forensics, accounting forensics, digital forensics, cyber forensics, and even psychology forensics are becoming very, very STEM oriented and very STEM dependent. Uh, programs, full degree programs are emerging in some of the areas that you see in front of you. And when, when someone like me as a chief academic officer of a a major technological university uh, is asked, uh, which is very typical by faculty members, uh, where should these programs be hosted? Uh, should that program in forensics be hosted in the College of Arts and Sciences or the College of Engineering or the College of Computing or in the Health Sciences? Uh, my answer or the answer of traditional academic chief academic officers used to be pick one and there will be collaboration. Now the movement is, it doesn't really matter where the degree or the training or the PhD program or the graduate program is emanating from or starting from or housed in. Uh, what really matters is that we do the program and it could be labeled as an interdisciplinary program jointly offered by several departments and or several schools and several colleges. And that again includes areas in product design, commercialization, digital integrated marketing, uh, artificial intelligence, obviously, uh, and, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, again, not everything requires a degree program or training, uh, certifications, uh, stacked credentials, credit or non-credit, and again, emerging areas that are very, very cross-disciplinary, like multimedia artistry and animation. Uh, we worked on a uh, very exciting uh, robotic musician project between the electrical engineering department, the computer science department, the department of music and mechanical engineering uh, to basically create a robotic band uh, that toured the US for a couple of years. Again, an example of an exciting uh, project uh, within the area of, of music and arts that enabled us to create a, a robotic humanoid band uh, that actually has many, many, many degrees of freedom per instrument uh, than, an art, than a musician has, which are really the 10 fingers. Um, and, and that created something exciting and very different from digital music uh, uh, and, and, and interesting. Uh, again, biometrics, whether it's facial detection, iris detection, gait detection, uh, or many other areas is again, one of these uh, disciplinary research areas uh, in which people in signal processing, electrical engineering, cognitive sciences for emotion detection, um, and also uh, uh, machine perception, pattern recognition, and image processing from electrical engineering, computer science, uh, and many other areas would collaborate to create these uh, uh, credential certifications research areas. Personalized medicine and pharmacy. Uh, again, uh, uh, drugs in the future, and I think it's going to be very fast now. Uh, are not going to be uh, generic ones uh, and prescription ones. They're going to be drugs for particular human beings. Uh, so based on your own DNA, based on your own genetics, uh, we, you, will have your own version of things like aspirin, your own version of things like an antibiotic for stress infections that works perfectly well for you because of your own DNA and genetics that would be most effective for you. And, and, and that will be uh, basically your own factory to create these. Uh, that requires incredible work within the area, again, of uh, uh, the ph pharmacy, uh, material sciences, biochemistry, and, and, and biology, uh, social entrepreneurship, sustainable development. Uh, again, uh, looking at uh, the agenda for new administrations, uh, sustainable development, climate change, uh, is at the foremost of everything we do. Uh, recognizing events uh, that causes climate change, being able to mitigate them uh, via things like smart dust and sensors and uh, recognition of them is, is, is crucial. Not only within the area of climate change, but the area of building, uh, whether it's 3D printing houses that are environmentally sustainable, uh, whether it's making absolutely sure that everything we build and design and mitigate is a zero carbon structure, uh, is, is a requirement. Again, that requires background in several areas. Uh, given the way uh, 17, 18 year olds think, or 15 year olds, uh, gaming technology is very virtual reality. It's not only for the gaming industry, but for learning purposes is an emerging field. Internet of Things, connected structures, big data analytics is really the key. Uh, the concept of autonomy. And, and by that, I mean everything. I mean autonomous cars, which are starting to be everywhere. Uh, autonomous armies, actually, uh, within the defense industry. Uh, because within the defense industry, the proposition is not to actually have human soldiers at all anymore. It's all going to be humanoid soldiers, humanoid drones, humanoid unmanned air vehicles, humanoid uh, mobile structures and tanks, and submarines and boats and so on. The area of autonomy is, is, is where the future is. And by, the, by that, I mean, again, within the area of defense, within the area of transportation, uh, within the area of service. Um, and again, this is a futuristic look, look but we're really already there. Uh, the, the whole idea of manual work, the whole of idea of requiring humans and paying humans to do manual work, whether again, it's in the building industry, whether it's in the service industry, the hospitality industry, is gonna disappear. Maybe not in my generation, maybe close to being, you know, the generation of people who are within their teens now, but definitely within the generation of 50, 50 years from now. Uh, again, uh, uh, the, the perennial question is when, when we talk about the disappearance of manual work, and actually, it's not even only manual work, it's even semi-cognition work. Uh, so things like reading the uh, MRIs and CAT scans and X-rays 
uh, you know, experienced radiologists uh, do a great job because they have seen many, many of these and diagnosed them over the years. So they have this inherent mental expertise because they have done many of them and uh, diagnosed based on seeing many of these uh, scans. Well, when we have an expert system that's incredibly trained on a set and a database of a billion such cases and X-rays and MRIs that have already been diagnosed, and that's the database that exists within that artificial intelligence system, coupled with a good recognition and pattern recognition system, that system will do diagnosis for MRIs, CAT scan, and, and X-rays a hundred times better than the most well, incredibly qualified physician, even uh, radiologists, uh, even uh, in interventional radiology and surgery. Now we're talking about robotic surgeons. Now we're talking about surgeries being done at, at a very, very less invasive structure. And very soon it will be autonomous. The concept of manual labor and the concept of, of, of limited cognition requirement jobs is going to completely disappear, in my opinion, again, within the next 50 years. Building houses, building structure does not really require humans anymore. It requires uh, building materials that will be dispensed via things like drones and autonomous cars. It requires autonomous structures that, you know, carry blocks and builds them and do 3D printing given, you know, uh, raw materials, uh, including the most uh, elaborate structures that needs to be built. Uh, service, uh, uh, again, we're seeing this in many places, even during COVID, even in very simplistic scenarios, like restaurants, we're seeing robots doing the service, we're seeing robots manning things like hotels and so on and so forth, even things like uh, 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 shops and supermarkets. Uh, you know, you take a look at the Amazon supermarket uh, in, in the Bay Area and many other areas, the whole supermarket does not have any human workers. Everything is done autonomously. Everything is done and stacked and so on by robots, etc. cetera. And, and actually that's the intermediate step. Uh, you know, people walk again and they get what they want, you know, and so on and so forth in the future. And we're seeing the expansion of e-commerce. They won't even need to go anywhere. Everything we were ordering, especially during that you know, COVID period, we're ordering on the cloud, we're ordering via the internet. Robots are moving them from one warehouse to the other. And very soon, robotic devices and already companies like Amazon's and others are working on it. They would be delivered autonomously to your homes via drones and via unmanned air vehicles and humanoid robots who would move from the unmanned air vehicle to the front steps of your home. Uh, so so it's, it's really fascinating. And, and, and again, the whole concept of work is gonna change. Does that mean we're gonna end up with a work workforce that's 70% unemployed? The answer of course is absolutely not, right? All of these jobs, you know, the manual job that would be roboticized, all of these new paradigms, et cetera, uh, will require a very different type of workforce, a workforce that develop these applications, that make these prototypes, that think about the implications from a legal and ethical delivery point of view, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It is really a brand new world. So again, new trends and challenge areas, uh, again, neurosciences, sensing, machine vision, Asian-based systems, uh, the prevalence of robotics and autonomy in everything we do, uh, again, uh, from a workforce development point of view, uh, areas that were incredibly complex and, complex and required integration in traffic and weather and intelligent infrastructures and 3D making and printing and building control systems is going to be completely roboticized and or automated. Uh, in an autonomous or teleautonomous manner, advanced materials and manufacturing uh, training will be required for all disciplines from a making point of view. Uh, perception technology, not only I get for defense application, but for the service industry, uh, are 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 required. Uh, of course, the area uh, that would be last, and again, with things like climate change, uh, with uh, uh, and, and zero carbon structures and cities and and what's going to happen uh, with cars uh, in the future and starting to happening now, uh, renewable energy, all facets of renewable energy and training in sustainable energies. Again, wind, biofuel, many other aspects within that area uh, will become a very needed area for training. And again, 
uh, one do not know how to classify that. Uh, could be, again, uh, electrical engineers working very closely with mechanical engineers, working with sustainably trained individuals in many different areas, including environmental sciences uh, and chemists and physicians, uh, physics trained individuals uh, will be required. Bottom line is, we should not really abandon all we know, but rather complement what we do with emer these emerging paradigms. We have to get out of our comfort zone as educators, as professors, as teachers, as students, as trainers, uh, because that's the only way to, number one, have an impact in the future, and number two, to sustain a career in the future. Uh, I, I, I always and just uh, tell my own students, uh, when I did my own uh, PhD dissertation uh, close to, well, <laughs> close to 30 years ago, uh, and that was, you know, a, 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 a very, very good work in the area, again, of autonomous observation of robotics. Uh, at that time, that was uh, groundbreaking and exotic and exciting. And I tell my undergraduate students, uh, the work that, uh, you know, was one of the you know, very exciting robotics paradigms, you know, 30 years ago, you're doing that work right now as sophomores, as uh, second year undergraduate students. Um, what we're teaching our students now uh, is really not prescriptive because they will have to life learn on their own to be productive professionals. Uh, and probably 60, 70% of what we're teaching them now is going to become obsolete. Uh, 10, 20 years from now anyway, and uh, may, not all of it, but, you know, the, the, the applications of it. Uh, so they need to be lifelong learners. They have to be able to get out of their comfort zone and be exposed to other disciplines. Uh, if they don't do that in their undergraduate and graduate training, 